Welcome to uh, the Student Publishing with Google Sites, a conversation with Todd Conway from UW Bothell, who's an expert in this. And I'm Chris Lott, the learning designer here at uh, UW Tacoma Office of Digital Learning. Uh, I don't need to introduce myself because you all are bored with me, I think. So let's just get right to the guest. Todd Conway, how are you? I'm good. Thanks. And uh, can you tell us about yourself a little bit? Sure. I uh, work here with the wonderful faculty on the Bothell campus uh, and meet wonderful people like Chris and Darcy uh, and feel very fortunate to uh, work with people around higher education. Uh, my work uh, has been, in, in, I've been an instructional designer for uh, about 17 years, uh, seven of those here and 10 of those in uh, community college in Arizona. Um, as you probably are aware, the internet has uh, thrown a lot of possibilities at us, uh, a lot of uh, tension, a lot of anxiety, and uh, that's where I work. <laughs> so, <laughs> in, uh, in the world of tension, anxiety, and ambiguity. Yeah, and, and possibilities, right? I, I was a high school English teacher when computers just sort of made it into the classroom. So uh, for me, I learned about computers literally in the context of daily teaching English to high school students. And, uh, you know, it pre YouTube, pre all that. And it's just been amazing how the opportunities we have been blessed with that cause us so much anxiety. <laughs> so. That's right. What yeah. What is the, the ancient curse? May your life be as interesting as, as possible. Yeah, so I, it, yeah, that's my job. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, and uh, serendipitously, because I had seen you around in various circles before, I think usually with a lot more hair than, than now and on a bicycle a lot uh, via many circles I hang out in. So it was great to land here at UW and you were one of the first people outside of UW Tacoma I was able to connect with. So, and I know you have a lot of experience with um, Google Sites. So I'm glad to have you here to help us understand it and how it works and how you've seen it in use and used it yourself. But before we kind of get into the innards of Google Sites, I just wanted to talk a little bit about working in the open. And I know everyone who, who works in the open has different um, uh, thoughts about, about it and why they do it and what the values are. And, and so you shared a great qu quote from our mutual friend, Jim Groom, kind of talking about the possibility. And this was posted back a little bit uh, ago, but it's even more important now, I think, in terms of kind of not just sharing and cooperation and those values, but also that we're, like he says, a battle for the future of the web. We are trying to make changes and transformations in education using these tools and applications and networks that we have. Um, and so for me, there's an intrinsic motivation just because I enjoy it. I like working in the open. I like having a large community like that. And I like my students to experience that before they go into the real world and are forced potentially to experience it. Um, but what about you, Todd? What, what, what is in it open for you and the faculty you work with? What, what, what entices people? I think that um, like, that's a good call. Like it's sort of more of the real world, right? Like uh, you won't probably be hanging out in Canvas after you graduate and you're at your job at where you're not. working. Yeah, right. So, so uh, as we might've uh, interpreted from John Dewey, right? Like we want it to be the, we want these experiences for students to be the real world or be as, as real world as possible. And, and it's not unlike writing the essay where the only audience is a, a teacher, right? That's not really a very authentic audience. Yeah. So putting it out in the open, and I use that term kind of both at the extreme of anybody can see it, uh, to being able to choose your own kind of destiny. Like, I want to only share it with Chris and these three other people. That at least that is more in the spirit of uh, an authentic audience rather than um, just the faculty involved. Um, yeah, so I, yeah. I think uh, the article there called Reclaiming Innovation, that's a link on this site, is, is pretty wonderful and well worth reading um, as well. Absolutely. And I, and I know, I'm, I'm sure you probably feel the same way, but uh, I met Jim Groom a long time ago and have worked with him quite a bit. He was kind of a hero of mine. I remember being very nervous to meet him the first time because he was in the edgy punk phase. And I was like, I hope I'm punk enough for, for Jim Groom here. Um, 
And, and I've shared here on, on the page for everyone some other thoughts or more thoughts about values from Open that I think we, we both share. And I think the public performance, the authentic audience thing is an interesting kind of uh, juxtaposition because on the one hand, I think there are there's great power in working in the open because you know you potentially have an audience, right? And you it's more than just your teacher and more than just your peers. But at the same time, you most often don't really have an audience because no one is seeing what you're doing, right? No one's finding it. So it's it's I always find that an interesting tension. Um, so part of it for me is also trying to help the students make those connections outside of the class as they're doing that work, right? So tying into the professional communities and communities of learning that are, that are already out there, um, which does lead to, to me to the considerations of as a student being asked to work in the open and that authentic audience and how do they know you? And also do they know it's you? Which kind of leads to the second item we wanna cover here, which is the FERPA, FERPA fear, FERPA FUD. Um, there is there there are a lot of entities out there. There are a lot of pressures out there to say work within Canvas. We support Canvas, and that's what you do. Oh, and we have maybe you know you Google Docs limited to the classroom. Maybe you can do that. But there's there's a lot of push to keep things within the walls of the institution, within the walls of applications, because of you know for various reasons. One, it's simpler to support. You don't have to worry about ambiguity when it comes to audiences and things like that. But the reality here on the ground is. As a faculty member at UW, you can work outside using any platform you want. You can use a plethora of the bags of gold that Jim refers to, that Gardner Campbell talks about, that we mentioned, um, as long as you observe two really simple tenets. One, allow your students to use an alias. Now, I would say talk to your students about this because they may not want to. You may not, you know, you may want them to see what the value is to have this attributed to them. A couple of years ago, there was a lot of fear about and talk about the digital footprint and things following you for the rest of your life. And that's certainly something to consider. But as we were just talking about, the reality of that audience is different from the fear. Um, and I don't know about you, Todd, but I have a hard time finding things I made a year ago, much less things that are going to follow me. I can't find things I want to find. Uh, because of link rot and changes. Um, so I like to talk to the students and, and share with them what the value is of being out there, why they might make this choice, and then let them make that choice. And sometimes people change along the way. They start with an alias and, and they move on. Um, what's been your experience with students and using aliases and, and working in the open like that? I think it's a great conversation to have. It leans in towards what we all see or talk about as being literate in a digital world. Uh, the literacy of being digital, digitally uh, knowledgeable. Um, you know, you can put your, your personal video on YouTube and even though it's public, you know, you're just competing with a whole lot of cat videos and nobody's going to watch your video, right? Yeah, I mean, there's something it, like 250,000 videos a day added to YouTube or something. Yeah, insane it's just like so, that. so the, the word public is what I feel like and creates a lot of anxiety because public speaking is like everybody's worst nightmare, right? So you put <laughs> that out there where you don't even know who's laughing at you. And man, you're like, I don't know, you have a bad hair day. You're just, you're not going there. So I think that there's a lot of um, anxieties around the, the notion of public. Um, yeah. what, what is really helpful in it being public is that it is easier to choose who you do want to send it to. For example, this very Google site that we're looking at right here. Uh, any anybody watching this who has access to the URL, the link for it, can share this if they choose with anybody they want in any place that has internet access. We could choose, Chris and I could choose to limit that access to just my five favorite, well, my only friends. I got five of them. Um, so I think that we definitely need to uh, get away from the fear and anxiety and perhaps really think about and have conversations about with students, you know, do you put the, the party picture on uh, Instagram of you passed out on the floor last week? Probably not. <laughs> Is it okay to have some information about something you wrote or a field trip to the zoo that you took or your thoughts on some grand topic? 
why not, right? Uh, you're, I think, so here's another one other thing real quick. Mm -hmm. I think that I see students as teaching other students, like any group of students I see, I just feel like there's an, an enormous amount of power in that space for them to um, be the teachers for one another, right? They're, they're yeah. co-learning, they're co-creating, they're, uh, they're learning from each other. And um, that, that is often overlooked, partly just because the structure of classrooms with the chairs all facing one direction or whatever, but in Canvas, same thing. The assignment is only viewed in many cases by the teacher or two peer reviewers. Um, so yeah, those are my Yeah, arguments. I mean, I, and I think that learning to be a learner involves understanding that it's okay to evolve and change as you grow. So I'm sure if you search around out there, you can find things I said five, 10, 15 years ago about various topics or whatever, and I may not be the same, feel the same way or think the same things today. And that's okay, like that's that's learning. And that idea of being kind of an example and continuing to build that community with further and later students, I think is really awesome because one of the great things is showing students, hey, here's what last year's students did. So you can kind of see how it works and get a context. And, and, and it's also, it's okay if a, a new cohort repeats many of the same things, right? Because they're learning. Um, I often hear like, well, if my students build this thing out here, if they use a Google site and they build around the topic, the next students, what are they gonna do? Well, they're gonna do the same thing and that's okay. Like, you know, maybe they'll learn more from the previous students and integrate that. I think that's great. But as, as I think you'll probably hear Todd say a lot, and I say a lot too, almost all of these kind of questions, concerns, and worries are just opening points for conversations to figure things out. And we all have them. We all, we all hear them. Um, the other part of FERPA that you need to, to be aware of it has to do with not grading in public. And obviously, most people know I'm not going to post a grade on an item in public. But what you need to also think about is that comments that are essentially evaluations that kind of convey uh, a grading or an evaluation level, you might want to stay away from that, right? So I love having conversations with students and I like to continue their improvement um, out in the open, but I'm trying to be careful that it, you can't read my comment and construe, oh, that person didn't do a great job. That person probably failed that assignment or, or anything like that. Uh, if you're interested in the legal details, there's some information down here. You can search, you can read through all the legalese you want, okay? But follow those two principles, using aliases if they want, if your students want to, and don't post grades in public, I think you're golden. And boy, that opens up the world for a lot of opportunities, one of which is Google Sites. Um, and so, Todd, I'm going to hand it over to you to show some examples of Google Sites and maybe talk about uh, how it works and how it's worked uh, in these examples and in your experience. Let me stop my sharing here for you. All right, that sounds good. Uh, yeah, so I am going to share uh, several different examples of different types of things that we have uh, learned about, uh, things that colleagues here at uh, Bothell have created. Uh, and one thing that's important to remember just about Google Sites and any student or faculty member at UW is that you actually have very likely you have two Google accounts or more. You have your personal account that you've used for 20 years, and you have your UW account that was given to you when you got hired and will be taken away when you leave. Or uh, so, so it's a good thing to ponder. Uh, the Google Sites that is integrated into the University of Washington's Google suite of tools uh, has kind of pre-populated things in it. So it's a little easier to, to say, add five students to a Google site. Um, and for the students, if you tell one student to make a Google site and add students five, six, and seven, it's a little easier for them to do that with the UW account. Uh, the drawback is, of course, uh, they need to do some clicking and some trickery to make sure that when they leave the institution, if they choose, they can take their Google site with them. Otherwise, it will disappear along with all the rest of the things that they have in their, in their Google yeah. sites. Yeah, and I just want to point out here, too, that if you're using, so Google Sites is just a generic, general web building platform, so you're building out in the open web. One use of it I've seen a lot of our faculty building kind of portfolios in there. 
or sharing their work. And, and if you're a part-time lecturer, UW is pretty draconian about cutting access off to materials. So you definitely wanna be careful to transition that ownership to your private account if it's something that you uh, want access to if you're a part-time lecturer in between terms. And I've seen some of that. Also, you can talk to, if you're UW Tacoma, you can talk to me, but anywhere at UW, you can find out about getting your account provisioned by someone to continue access between teaching terms if you're a part-time lecturer. Because I do think Google Sites is a great way to build a portfolio uh, as an instructor. Yeah, Google Sites is, is a great introduction into, hey, what if I could do this on the internet? It's just fairly yeah. simple. And we'll run through like very basic how to's at the end of this, but uh, let's just take a look at what uh, some other people have done. Uh, this is a faculty of uh, behavioral health who ran a COIL course, which is a collaborative uh, online international learning, or I think something along those lines. But he had, you know, several, a class here in Bothell, and then he had students in. Uh, the Tokyo Medical and Dental University or something along those lines. If you look up at the top, it's just a website. So it's got all of these, you know, options or, or pages. And on any one of them, uh, pictures change and the text changes, right? So here are some of the posts from the various students he had about whatever, you know, optimism it looks like in this case. Um, and this is what it would look like. And this is just one way to kind of organize material on this site. All of, he made up all of these, right? He made up all of these, all the navigation, he ordered it in the way he wanted it to, to be. Um, and he added all of the students. So any one of the students could have actually changed any of this had they wanted to, but they could all contribute to it as equals which is an interesting concept, right? The students are contributing to the course equally. There is no difference really between co, the, the faculty members capacity to manage this and the students. So it really lays flat the uh, hierarchy of the classroom, which- So giving some uh, agency to the students and co-creation of curriculum. And I mean, co is in CO, but also co, I guess in this case. <laughs> Um, if you could go back to that one of those pages again, I just also want to point out just I, I think that I think I'm assuming probably where you're seeing the students, they they got in and were editing these right they weren't passing right. it to the instructor they're co contributing and collaborating on, on each of these pages. Or that is absolutely correct. Yeah, so videos, photos, I mean, it, yeah, and it's, you know, it, I don't think any of these folks were web designers and, and collectively clearly they were not really web designers but they were able to choose and manage where they wanted stuff to go. And yeah, one of the great things about Google Sites as a platform for me is I'm not a graphic web designer. I'm not great with that. So it's nice to have the kind of ease of creating something that's visually and aesthetically pleasurable, right? Yeah, and, and like I said, uh, Google Sites is just such an easy access step into that space. Um, all right, so the next one here is uh, what we're going to look at a little bit more in a moment is a liquid syllabus. Uh, this basically is a it's, it's a website uh, faculty made with all the stuff that you would normally see on a course syllabus. Uh, it's it's just navigated differently, right? Instead of 12 pages of text, you get a picture, you get a picture of the person, you get a picture of some options you have links to other things that may be important and you have the ability to navigate through each of these things as you want uh it's it's nice because you can go back and just simply change the dates on this page leaving everything else the same right mm -hmm. or perhaps you could make it so it really doesn't have autumn 2022 would it be any more powerful or would it have less meaning if it didn't say 2022 here? Probably yeah. not because you're the teacher and you've directed people. It says, you know, it's got the Bothell logo. It's got the name of the class. I mean, it's a great resource. And I feel like, I, you know, Chris and I both have probably seen enough um, 
syllabi, syllabus in a course that was from the prior year, and students are seeing that and other things that you may or may not have wanted them to see. So well, another interesting point, too, is consider seeing this as a prospective student versus seeing the three lines in the registration catalog describing this course. Yeah. Um, and consider, you know, so and consider just being someone out there who maybe can't afford to take the course or can't fit it into their schedule and just is interested in the topic. Like they have so this is such a great resource for for self-motivated learners and prospective learners. Yeah, I mean, think of. Before you leave your English 101 class, you send them an email and you say, hey, English 102 is really exciting. Here's some information about it. Yeah. And those people, if and you could even add, if you think your friends might want to see it, here <laughs> they go, right? Yeah. And so now you've got kind of broadened your ability to connect the amazing course you teach with future uh, students or possible future students. So yeah, there's a lot of ways. And you, again, these links are all in this Google site. So you can, you can kind of go through here. And um, basically the idea here is that it replaces a traditional syllabus. She doesn't have in this case, a video that introduces the class, but she could just as easily have created a small video about the topics that are covered in the course or whatever. And that would be of value. And so, you can embed all kinds of material from also if you're a mind map concept mapper if you're a video creator if you're an audio person you can use and embed and create uh, implement all that stuff in these sites yeah yeah so so what we've looked at thus far is is a class that was uh co-created uh in google sites by the faculty and all the students this this particular item we're looking at now was just created by the um faculty this next one is a mix of those, again, where it's created by the faculty, but it's got tons of student work attached to it in different places. Um, this is Ko's work again, and he was super excited about Padlet some years ago. And so a lot of his discussion forums are done or his, or his curation of materials or um, sharing experiences uh, are in here and they're done through the vehicle called Padlet. But he went pretty bonkers here on like, <laughs> like look at how this looks compared to your Canvas course or right. anyone you've seen, right? I mean, it just looks a little bit nicer, right? Uh, it, even just at that level, um, nice pretty pictures of the textbooks, you know, he's got some recommended reading, the ever uh, frightening grading scheme and all this <laughs> stuff. But check out like what's in the class, right? So much like all of us, maybe our Canvas course is divvied up into modules or whatever. Um, but look at all the different things that and how they're organized, how they're arranged. And if you click on any one of them, you know, here you go. You can go see what's in there. And um, it's it, instead of PowerPoint slides, he has this. It's a it's a more of a narrative format in a way. At least it's a top to bottom rather than um, <laughs> it's still a hierarchy, right? It, it, you scroll through it, but all the information is on one page rather than chunks of it on many. Yeah, like it does give it more of a narrative flow, I think, or you can you can implement it that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, oh, I just had I had a good thought. Oh, so one of, I'm sure Chris would agree here, a, a huge challenge of mine is getting uh, a faculty who teaches, uh, go back to English 101 and English 102, the faculty who teaches uh, English 102 may not be able to see exactly what's in English 101 because they don't teach that class and they don't have access to somebody's course. That's right. right? This eliminates that whole thing. Anybody can go here and see what BNURS 360 has in it, right? Uh, hugely valuable. I have learned that, you know, for me, my job is to connect faculty to each other. And sometimes that's simply in the form of being able to see and wonder about the material and structure of their courses. So that is uh, such a great point. I, I spend, you know, I have... have so many times I've had to 
talk to a faculty member about letting another faculty member into their Canvas course so they can take a look and then what view they have. And this eliminates all of that. And I mean, personally, I feel like as a public institution, the great majority of what we do should be open anyway, but certainly the previous site we looked at with the basics of the class, that should all be public anyway. But since it is not and not in an easy fashion, this allows you to do that. And yeah, it's so much easier and, and so much more inviting, right? Like if I, if I point somebody to this site and say, hey, here's the link, here's Co's email address or include Co in the, the message, then they can, you know, communicate and see it. It's just so much, feels so much more open and inviting than a closed Canvas course to do that. It's an open door as opposed to a closed one. Yeah, there you an go. Open door is usually more inviting. That's yeah. true. That's that's truth. All right. So this is like the whole class, right? This is he, yeah. there's nothing in Canvas except, and he does use the grade book in Canvas, right? Yeah. So he is grading things. Uh, it is a different way of getting the information and and whatnot. And yeah, I think, uh, you know what, I, I'm not sure if it's actually required because as long as you enter the grades in some way, but um, here it's generally the best practice is to have at least the grade book in Canvas. So you have the material record that's retained by the system, even if there's nothing else there, um, you know, keep that grade book there. Another so, point before we move on, Todd, I just want to ask, because you mentioned Padlet and is with another external tool that is, is pretty popular. Um, you might, yeah, okay, you can see it here. That's great. Um, and I noticed while that's coming up, a uh, mention of Hypothesis, uh, which is another tool that both integrates with Canvas, but is also open. And I just wanted to point out that that's one of the great strengths of the open web, of course, is that you have the navigation in and out of different applications and the embedding of different applications. So you could expand your, your toolbox so greatly without having the complications of how do I get back into Canvas and can I display it there and how do I go back and forth? Uh, so Padlet, I think, is a great example, you know, pretty much any tool that you can get to that's open, right? Right. So here's all the students, right? Yeah. If I, was Co, I would have probably made this window larger, but that's okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, here's the students and there you go. I mean, this this is really the internet, right? Like where stuff from one place is taken and placed in another and, you know, ever these people can all participate equally. Um, and you do uh, have the option here to co is provided to click the link and actually go to Padlet outside of the Canvas class. So you get a little more screen real estate and things like that. Yeah, I, yeah. This this icon right here would open this in a whole new tab. That is and those as, changes, as, as yeah. with this, right? Yeah. And those just to be clear for people who might not have done this but much, the changes you do in in Padlet or in this, you know, this, they are reflected back in the course because you've embedded that page in the course. So it's it's live updating material. Right, which is yeah. which is great. Um, yeah. So this this was a you know again, there's no right or wrong. These are just qualities of experience, right? And and so if this is something that you find and your students seem to be finding useful, there it is. And sorry to dwell on this for one more second, but I also want to point out two things. One is, I think that working out on the open web helps facilitate larger thinking about what conversation and discussion means. Right, because we get so accustomed to Canvas and a linear post-based kind of style of discussion that we don't think about other modes. And Padlet provides one of those. And I just continue to think, looking at this Padlet example, how much better this is for introducing students to each other than even the, the Canvas discussion board, simply because of the, the Padlet layout that puts more in view and makes it easier to see the other students instead of scrolling through this long list and trying to see. Uh, and see what's been added as a comment is more difficult. So, I, you know, these tools open up different ways of engagement and thinking uh, to the traditional approach we might have in the containerized uh, world of Canvas. Absolutely. Uh, agree 100%. So the next site is all about Todd, but it was built as simply as an example for people just like you. Uh, if you had an, uh, uh, an assignment that asked three students to work collaboratively together, what would that look like in Google Sites? And it would look about like this. Pictures would obviously hopefully be different. Uh, the information would be different, but here's kind of the three people uh, who are involved and you have some nice Latin language about who they are, that could or could not, maybe you don't want that on the home page. Each student of course would have their own page. They could add whatever kind of language they want. 
Um, and it's a pretty elegant way to share the work. And they can name these whatever they want. They can put whatever they want on these pages um, and make it work. So here's Which also video. reminds me as faculty members, if you do presentations at conferences or, or wherever within the institution, man, throwing up a Google site, which takes about 30 seconds if you have the link to get started versus sharing a PowerPoint file or how do I put the PowerPoint? I can put it on iCloud, right? And then I can, no, you can just open up Google sites and create a site to support your presentation and, and make changes on the fly as you need to. Yeah, I, yeah. I have not, I've done, I do a lot of presentations. And uh, I have not used PowerPoint for probably 10, 50, I don't know, a long, many, many years. And <laughs> I, I do this because, because it's a link that has videos in it, links to other things. It has all the words, the photos, the bullet points I want, but I have way more control over it. And it's easier to share than a you know, 12 megabyte PowerPoint file on my computer, Google Docs, really elevated that a lot by being able to share a Google Doc. But um, I like even a little bit more control, you know, than- Yeah, the, yeah, uh, I mean, the, as a pair of saying, kind of having Google Slides made it easier to share slides, but again, they're slides. And Google Docs are great, but they're Docs. It's like sharing a Word document, right? So this is that kind of next step in terms of openness, design, ease of sharing, you know, e ease of changing, you know. Absolutely. So, um, so this would be like what three students say around a specific topic might might create. This next one is uh, yeah, this great is students something. speaking all that Latin, by the way. I know. Well, look at this. This That's is even even amazing. more people. Uh, this might be more aligned with say your faculty website or your uh, school uh, some particular group. I can't even remember what E C S C L actually stood for. Um, but somebody wanted an example of what a, a Google Sites could do for them as a public facing website. And so if you have a particular project that you're working on or, um, you know, you want to create a website that demonstrates your skills or your work in some area, this Google Sites, I guess one of the nice, powerful things that we'll see in a minute is that you can really control all of the the, the levels and navigation of the site. Um, and, and this is kind of also different than a um, PowerPoint presentation. The navigation is on every page you go to, right? Like it, it's always right here. Whereas in, in a PowerPoint presentation, if you're like on slide 37, got to like a long way to go back to slide six right here it's always in the, in the same space and, and i want to mention too that at uw tacoma at least they really cracked down on using canvas for things that aren't credit generation or directly involved in instruction so i'm approached regularly by committees and program groups and you know faculty curriculum reform groups or whatever who want a canvas site to house their working activities from the committee so documents and minutes and resources, Google Sites is a great place to do that. It gives you a better kind of view, again, as opposed to, say, a bunch of Google Docs. And it's certainly a lot easier to use than the, you know, here at UW Tacoma, the Drupal website, which is very complicated and painful to edit. Or I don't even know what, what would it be, One OneDrive and Teams and SharePoint or whatever. Man, just using a Google site, restrict access to the people on the committee, done. Yep, agreed. Uh, the next one is a student site. This is built, so you'll notice the difference, say, between the, the way the navigation looks here. It's it's the still drop-down menus, but this is uh, old Google Sites, which uh, like maybe five years ago, there was a, a pretty serious upgrade largely uh, that was related to um, being responsive. So the site would fit different. It would look nice on a phone or on your desktop computer. Um, this is built in one of the older versions. Um, I think you can still build content, uh, I think, um, in the old sites. Um, but you can tell kind of the difference in the, the way the sites look. Uh, navigation is slightly different. Um, 
Yeah, so this is, I shared this primarily because of the idea of portfolios, right? Uh -huh. Students having portfolios. And, you know. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Uh, this one is the another. So you might remember uh, wikis, right? So um, here it's the navigation is just on the left rather than across the top. You may remember back in the day all the navigation for every website was on the left. And then it seemed like all of a sudden, it was always across the top. Um, wikis, which have been around a long time, uh, this has that look to it. Exactly. And, yeah. yeah, and again, it can be collaborative in nature, which is exactly what a wiki was, multiple people sharing their information on a single web page or multiple web pages contained in a website. So um yeah so this is a wiki yeah uh, and i wanted and one of the reasons i wanted to share this is one because i just every time i use a wiki after, i was just commenting about this somewhere else every time i use a wiki after not using one for a while and i know this is google sites as a wiki but i just kind of remember how fun that is like how simple and fun it is to just link and make something and link and make something and also i don't know if this ha happens on can be done on the new site new Google sites or not, but that sub pages menu at the bottom that shows what is linked underneath. I don't like, I think that's a pretty great feature because it's automatically maintained as you build links out from this page, the backlinks thing. Yeah, I mean, it, interestingly, Canvas is built on a wiki platform. So you may oh. know it, not know it, or may not know this, but you can actually change any page, not quizzes, not assignments, oh, yeah, that's not right. discussions any page in Canvas, you as a faculty have the ability to make it editable by your students. That's right. The, I forgot about that. the caveat there is that unlike Google Docs, where multiple people can type at the same time, in Canvas, that is not possible. So if one person opens it and starts typing, and then another person somewhere else opens it and starts typing, the first person to click save is going to get their stuff saved and the other person's stuff will just disappear. So, so it's kind of a perverse uh, incentive to work quickly, but maybe not the best incentive in the world. But but Canvas is built on that kind of old version of the wiki. In fact, you still see it in Canvas in terms of they're, they're still called wiki pages in some of the spaces that you might see uh, more settings and stuff like that. Interesting. So, I mean, I definitely encourage faculty to think about this model of collaborative editing. But as Todd said, within Canvas, you have the, the overwriting problem. I actually have that happen in Canvas, my, me having multiple tabs with the same page all the time. Um, but also it's not open, of course, right? So you're, you're missing on all the benefits of working in the open with that. That is correct. Yeah. So... So the next item up here is this uh, in the navigation, right? We're kind of just going from left to right here. Um, is is this up? So one easy step into creating a Google site would be to try and create like a syllabus for your class. Yeah. This is a great, I mean, it, it's copy and paste at many levels, right? So you already have all the information. Now you just have to kind of reshape it into this site. Uh, this is a great video about the why to do that, right? And it gives some good examples of what other people have done. Uh, this is a super short version of uh, why it might be of uh, benefit to you to do that. And again, there's uh, the example from uh, Sarita here in this class where hers is, uh, you know, you, you can follow this sort of navigation or create your own. Yeah. Um, but and I, I think that that one thing about the liquid syllabus, if I understand it, or at least I know I've heard of the living syllabus as well, is that mm -hmm. it allows you to look at the syllabus as a support document for the teaching experience that you can readily and easily change and modify and co-create with your students. Um, it's not, you know, some many faculty look at the syllabus as like a thing that is a top down, here's what the course is going to be and you must hew to it, whereas between using a co-created curriculum, working on things like a liquid or living syllabus, and you can combine that with other approaches to grading, which is something that we'll talk about um, in, in other teaching tip sessions, I think you can have a much more responsive class to, to help students learn and to, to adapt that learning to what was needed in the moment. Yeah, yeah. So I, I do think that this is a great, like, 
easy first step to get in here. And the truth is you can have like a thousand of these Google sites. So whether yeah. you, you, you first step is to try to make a syllabus or the first step you want to do is try to make one about cats. It doesn't matter. It, just getting in there and kind of seeing how it, wor it works. And that's the next thing uh, I think that we're going to, we're going to take a look at, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so let's see how, how you just quickly work with okay. Google Sites. I'm a faculty member. What, what do I do here? All right. So uh, first, I just want to show you ours, the, mm -hmm. the one we were just going through. This is what this looks like. You can see that Chris is still logged in to it. So if you had multiple people working together on this, you could see who was active, who was not. Um, and uh, yeah, so it is, it is. you can have multiple people working on it or it can be just yours. Uh, so let's go through what's possible and I'm gonna kind of go through these items and these items. And I'm gonna use our site here as the example, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm in the editing mode right now. You can, you can, this icon up here lets you preview it. So this is what you're seeing or you were seeing, right? This is kind of what the world will see. But let's just say we wanted to add something down here, right? Mm -hmm. So you can add text or you can add pictures, you can embed content, or you can grab content from your Google Drive. The most important thing here is that this Google Drive icon is connected to whatever account you're building this site in. Okay. One of the challenges we faced with a lot of the nursing students, not anymore, but back in the day, was that they would be building their Google site in their UW account, but they were saving all their essays and their the work they did for the class in their personal Google account. Okay. which is interesting right like <laughs> just that is kind of an like yeah you know what are we doing with this other uw account well that's where you have to make your google site so we don't tell them that anymore <laughs> um but uh you can add content very easily from your google drive and it embeds it into the page really nicely but uh so you can also just click down here in this area and you can see that you get that same pop-up, the same options there. Uh, these few little formatting things are super nice, right? Look at how nice this looks. You, this is what I used for this, right? I just grabbed a couple screenshots and put in some pictures. Um, you can add any image that you have on your desktop. Um, these items down here, you can add a YouTube video, you can add a calendar that's embedded, you can add a Google map. Um, yeah, these, these would all, docs and slides and sheets would all, sh all show up in your Google Drive. Um, but it's just an easy, there's not that many options, but enough to give you some flexibility with, say, font, for example, right? So, Here's mm -hmm. the text, and we don't want Pacifico anymore. We want some other other kind of font, right? It's fewer options up here in some way. You get some color and all that. But it. I think Google Sites is kind of a nice blend between being able to present it really elegantly and nicely and not too many buttons to click. Yeah. Yeah, it's so, got some guardrails that make it harder to make things less accessible or to break browsers or or things like that i think is yeah a good part of it. yeah i mean you should if you know if you're on this site on your desktop at some point um send it over and uh, send it to your phone get it on your phone and see what it looks like it's amazing it really does look nice yeah so so i'm going to just go across these three real quick so that this is the insert menu you can insert all of these types of things onto any page on the site the pages you'll notice home y open furfa those are these right mm -hmm. and you can add a page a link which that passport info in the navigation is you can embed other items or you can create a different section. Mm -hmm. So you can also, you can take these pages and nest them, right? You so see the menu changes immediately there. Yep. Yeah, so you can add these 
So now FERPA and liquid syllabus are nested under examples, right? Mm -hmm. um, lots of options to create, a, a, you know, navigation is super important. What do you begin with and what do you end with and what's between it? So um, that's something to give good thought to. Uh, there are a few themes that come with Google Sites by default. Uh, you can pick them at your, uh, I mean, there's only like five or six. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, okay. And again, it's kind of nice, right? Like there's yeah. not that many of them, which is kind of nice. Uh, and they all look pretty good. Um, they're nothing to be uh, completely amazed by, but they work. Um, so, so those are the insert, adding stuff, organizing stuff, and applying a general theme to the site. Great. Across the top, uh, this preview will show you what it's going to look like uh, on a desktop. It'll show you what it's going to look like on a tablet, and it'll show you what it's going to look like on a phone, right? And the preview, of course, shows you what this, the public view will be if you're not a contributor to the site. That is correct. Yep. The uh, link here will just give you a link to the site. This is where I added Chris. This is where any student who has access to this can, can add anybody they want. Uh, and then there's the general access. And this is, you know, super important, right? Uh, this one being probably the most important. You can make it so that only people at UW can see it. You can make it so nobody can see it. Uh, you can remove the public link. I have mine set so that uh, you, if you want, can go see it, right? Uh, yeah. So this is a, and you can give different access to Chris, right? I could change it so he could no longer be the editor anymore because I got mad at him the other day. So, um, um, also a point to note that there you can also transfer ownership, it said, which would allow you to transfer it to your personal account if you were having that need we were talking about earlier. That is correct. That is correct. Yep. So there's, you know, these tools, uh, these people have learned that people want to own or be able to control things. Um, so there are some very simple, uh, you can change where the navigation is. You could put it over on the left side. Um, the background color, some other items that I uh, I do not have on this site. Yeah. Um, there's a few more here. You can make a copy of what you have so that you could give those to other people. Uh, there's a version history, so I could go back and see what Chris added that all, when he said all the mean things about me. I could go back and make sure it was him. Uh, and then there's publish, so you can publish it so it's published to the public. And you, can, you also have to use this to publish any changes you make when you're sitting there working at it. Like, for example, I'm not going to click this right now because I don't want this the way it was. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it would change it for everybody. Um, yeah. Well, this is great. I mean, I think, I think the, the message is that this provides that simple, relatively simple way to build a website, right? It's, it's not in the container of Canvas. It's not, you know, it's not modularized that way. It's it's open. Um, you break outside of those frames. And there are some similarities in the editing functions and controls with Google Docs. So some of that's transferable knowledge when it comes to understanding some of the menus and some of the ownership. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just a great tool. And I, I remember back when I was learning to build on the web, as I'm sure you did too, Todd, learning HTML and transferring files via FTP and seeing how they looked. And if you wanted to like make a change to navigation, you had to change it on every single page that you had, had done it on. And so it's just so amazing. Again, thinking about those, the beginner's mind of realizing how wonderful these tools are and how, how amazing, the amazing capabilities they give us and, and not losing sight of that in the frustrations of learning how to use it sometimes. Um, I agree 100%. We will be, as part of the Teaching Tips series, looking at some other platforms, right, for publishing. So we will look at Pressbooks for collaborative book publishing. Uh, we'll look at what UW confusingly calls sites, which are actually WordPress blogs. And I hate to use word, the word blog anymore because WordPress is just another web publishing platform that lends itself to generally to a particular style, but it can be used to create pretty much any kind of site. So we'll talk about, about that, which is another potentially useful platform um, with the bigger message being 
think about working in the open. I think there are a lot of benefits to it and, and a lot of value. And I know personally in my life, pretty much, I mean, I have to think that 90% of the connections I've made and opportunities I've had have come from just putting stuff out there in the open and, and meeting and connecting with people that way and having people find me that way, um, usually for good. Uh, they find me for good most of the time. And it's been great. Um, and I, I think probably Todd has had the same experience since we're in the same circles quite often. I have, yes, absolutely. And one other thing I wanted to show, and then we'll we'll sh we'll close up here, is I wanted to talk a little bit about that link in this Google site that you will will be accessing um, up here. This is passport information. Uh, the passport information links to our our tip sheet on the same topic that has more links and resources for you, so you can access this. And I will update this to get a stamp, which is our Passport to Teaching Excellence program. And you can get stamps in all kinds of areas um, and all kinds of um, activities that you demonstrate what you can do when you get these stamps. And the badges or stamps are, are open badges that you can be used and shared in LinkedIn or other sites or on your portfolio or anything like that. And at the time of recording this, Anyone at UW is welcome to get a stamp, start a passport and get a stamp. So you'll be able to follow the link that's here if you wanted to get a, a stamp in publishing with Google Sites. And, you know, I think it's a, at least a fun way to kind of pursue this. And if you're at UW Tacoma, you will be hearing more about this, certainly in program development and faculty development events and, and meetings. And of course, if you have any questions on any of this, um, Todd's information is on there. So take all your really tough questions and stuff to him. But if you have other questions and things like that, uh, just kidding. If you have any, any need for support, you want to start with a Google site, you want to talk more about any of these concepts, any of the other teaching and faculty development for the Office of Digital Learning, my contact information is on wherever you're seeing this. Um, and you can explore and get help anytime you need it. I love having those individual conversations and working with you individually. To develop this stuff how, how any anything let me give us some good sage last words todd no pressure huh <laughs> you didn't tell me they were going to ask me that i know like uh, i like to bring a surprise this is active learning yeah right 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 so uh huh i'm going to share something my mother made when she was in her 20s okay i'm sitting on my wall right over here let's see Sorry, I got to move my monitor around. There you go. Uh, I love it. Becoming is superior to being. When you make these websites or your students make their stuff, they are working towards something. It's not the end. And the one amazing thing about the web is that it's unlike ink on paper, which is hard to erase. The web can be flexible, which is weird because that's a kind of a double-edged sword, right? Like, but at the same time, it tells a longer story by the nature of motion through time, whereas pen on paper is very more, it's more permanent stationary in time. Yeah, uh, it's an interesting is you've got a process and you're creating a, a living product too. Yeah, they're both beautiful, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's so amazing. Yeah. But I do think the web offers us that, especially think of students working together, right? It's it's all these pieces of being built through time. And so, uh, yeah, becoming Great. these projects, becoming your website, becoming your syllabus, whatever it is. Yeah. There's my, it's from my I love name. it. No, Paul that's Clay, great. Paul Klee, he was an artist. That was Paul Klee, the artist okay. who said that. So, but my mom made that like in her twenties. That's so awesome. Yeah, um, I love it. Always becoming, there's a philosopher who was famous for the always becoming kind of thing, maybe maybe Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, I don't know. But anyway, uh, I was going to say, cultivate beginner's mind. Like, enjoy the newness of it and look at the, you're going to have stumbling blocks, you're going to have frustrations again, that's part of learning and you're going to grow from that. But just always keep in mind just kind of how wonderful this stuff can be to, can, to help your students on their learning journey and their process. Um, and because I was silly and did not think to just create a page that just had a big you know, email address or something, I will just say here, contact me by searching for Office of Digital Learning at UW Tacoma, um, clot at uw.edu, get in touch with me, I'm happy to help, and I will hopefully see you in other future events. And I would really like to thank you, Todd, for, for joining and providing your expertise and sharing. It's always a pleasure. You're welcome. All right, talk to you later. <laughs>